Hi, I'm Ken. You might know who I am. You might not. Uh, depends on whether you were unfortunate enough to be paying attention to the election cycle that ended recently. I was the guy from the second presidential debate in the red sweater. I'm not wearing the red sweater today because I don't want to have to sign autographs in my own damn house. This video is just going to be me quickly telling my story. I'm 34 years old. I'm overweight. I'm married. I have a 13 year old son. I've been married for 13 years. Almost 13 years, so you do the math on that one, see how it worked out. I was born in a little town called Granite City, Illinois, right across the Mississippi River from St. Louis. It basically is St. Louis. That's why I tell people that I'm from St. Louis. I went to college right out of high school. Uh, I couldn't afford to go to any of the colleges that I wanted to go to, that I got accepted to. So I went to community college for a couple of years. I got a lot of associate's degrees. They just give associate's degrees away like confetti. You, you go and you sit in class and you fall asleep in your pajamas in a lecture hall. And eventually, as long as you don't screw up too much, they give you an associate's degree. So I think they have four of them. I don't really know. Uh, my girlfriend got pregnant. We got married. And being in community college and collecting associate's degrees that I didn't need didn't pay the bills. So I quit. I got a job as a pizza delivery guy and a truck driver for a warehouse and a lot of other dumb stuff until it got old. So I realized that there was no retirement from a minimum wage job, that I'd be doing it until my body was too broken down and I couldn't do it anymore. And then I'd be relying on my family or my friends or the government to take care of me. So I went back to school. I got my degree in electronics engineering and right out of school I got a job as a control room operator at a Coke plant. Not the kind of coke you drink, but this gray rock metallurgical coke that you burn to make iron. You smelt iron ore with it. Uh, from there, I got a job at a new power plant in southern Illinois. Uh, about seven years later, nothing really interesting had happened to me, because I'm just an average boring guy. I got a call from the Gallup poll. They're random. And since I had nothing better to do than watch cartoons on a Sunday afternoon, I answered the phone. They asked me who I was going to vote for for president, so I told them. They asked me how likely I was to change my mind on a scale of 0 to 10. And I didn't want to sound like a closed-minded jackass, so instead of saying 0, I said 2. The just about is the least likely you can get without it being impossible. And they said, okay, thanks, that makes you technically undecided. So since you're an undecided voter and you live in the St. Louis area where the town hall debates kind of take place, how would you like to come to the debate? I said, sure, that'd be cool. I'll sit in the, the debate audience. So I'll, uh, I'll take pictures. You know, I'll, I'll get to do all kinds of neat stuff. And they said, no, we want you to sit on the stage. We want you to ask the candidates a question if we have time to get to yours. So, wow, this is going to be amazing. Uh, I didn't realize that it was going to alter my life the way it did. But uh, you've all seen what happened. So I went the day of the debate, and we were there for... 14 hours. I showed up at 8 a.m. No, no electronic devices of any kind. Completely sequestered from the media. It's just me, the 39 other participants, and some volunteers locked up in a very tiny room. Uh, we got to know each other pretty well because there was nothing to do. There was no, uh, no Twitter, no Facebook, no phones to screw around on. Uh, so I think the table next to me was playing Parcheesi. Uh, I was reading A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Near the end of the day, we went and sat out on the stage. We were told where we were going to sit. I was sitting in the front row, wearing an extremely bright red sweater, uh, the story of which you might have heard. I had originally had a, an olive-colored suit I was going to wear. I would gotten too fat for it and tore the seat out of the pants. So instead, I wore this very bright red sweater. The internet fell in love with it when they saw it on television, and with me later, but mostly the sweater. The sweater, then the mustache, then me. But only me a little bit, I think. And I got to ask my question. My question was about energy. Uh, about how we protect our environment without just throwing people like me by the wayside. What do we do with people who work in fossil energy? All day while we were sitting at Washington University, we were being told, you know, there will be cameras, there will be media people. When you leave at the end of the night, there will be reporters who will want to talk to you. They want to take your picture. We'll have security guards with you so you don't have to do all that if you don't want to. 
It'll just take you to your car. It'll be over. No big deal. Thanks for doing your civic duty. So at the end of the night, after the debate is over, they say they're going to walk us back to our cars. The debate's been over for about 20 minutes. The crowd has thinned out. The candidates are securely in their motorcades going back to the airport. So we go to leave. A few security guards gather around a group of us and say, okay, there'll be reporters. There'll be things like that. Don't worry. If you don't want to talk to them, you don't have to, but you can. We walk through a big metal gate and start back to the parking garage and nothing. There's no reporters. There's no anybody. So I thought, oh, well, I thought it would have been neat to have my picture in the paper, but no big deal. I'll still have a neat story to tell my friends. I get back in my car and turn my phone on, and my voice mailbox is full. I have uh, several hundred text messages, Facebook messages. I didn't realize it at the time, but I had uh, three or four hundred Twitter followers already on a uh, Twitter account that I had forgotten I had. Uh, my friend called me on the phone and started reading me articles about me. I didn't believe him. I thought he was making it up. Everybody was calling me. Everybody wanted to talk to me. I don't know how they got my damn phone number. It's a listed number, I guess. You can Google Ken Bone enough times and you'll find it. Um, please don't, though. Uh, enough people call me. Uh, you, you guys are great, but I don't need any more random phone calls, please. So I, I get home and I see myself on television. It was, it was surreal. I didn't, I didn't expect it. Like I knew I would be on the debate. I knew I'd be on the program. I didn't expect people to be talking about me instead of the issues. I, I didn't understand it. So uh, after a lot of excitement and phone calls with family, I, I go to bed that night and I wake up to uh, a phone call at about three in the morning. Uh, asking me to be on a radio show in two hours. They were my first ever interview. And it was fun. I discovered that it was a, a good time doing interviews. And 15 minutes after that interview, I had another one. And then another one. And then another one. Until uh, by the end of that day, I had done about 25. I had been on the radio from Los Angeles to New York. Uh, from Houston to Canada. I had been on four different television stations, including J the Jimmy Kimmel Show and Anderson Cooper 360. Uh, that day was the first time I was on television. It was for CNN's The Newsroom. I was live at the Washington University campus. And it's the first time I told the story of splitting my pants. I don't know why I told that story on television, but I did, and now everybody knows it. Now everybody knows I'm too fat for my pants, in case you didn't recognize it from looking at me. The next day... I woke up and we did it again. The media started at 5 in the morning and ended at 1 a.m. That day I was on the Dr. Drew show. Um, I was on every local network. I was on Fox Business, Fox News, MSNBC. I was on a radio station in New Zealand. And the last media thing I did that day was at 1 a.m. for the morning show in Ireland, which for them was at 7 a.m. Uh, so now, at that point, I've been on the radio on both sides of the globe within a few hours. It was bizarre. Since then, I've been on in China, Russia, Poland, Sweden, Honduras, uh, multiple Canadian radio stations. I've been on either the radio or television in 22 different countries at this point, and I've done Skype interviews with about 10 more. I'm just your average, balding, overweight guy. I think that's what was lacking from this election season. People wanted to hear from a regular dude. The next day, Wednesday, is the day it started to get kind of tough. It's another early morning. It's like 5 in the morning, start doing interviews. Same deal all day, driving myself all over town, uh, keeping track of all this in a spiral notebook that I call my agent. I'm also my own publicist. Uh, there were some good things that happened Wednesday. It was the first day that I got a call from IZOD. Uh, they're my sponsor now. They're the people that made the red sweater. I thought that they were going to ask me to stop talking about the sweater. Uh, like, hey, fatty, we're an athletic brand. We're for, like, golf apparel. We don't, want to talk. we don't want you to be the face of our brand. Instead, they said, hey, you're an average guy. You play golf on the weekends. Uh, people are paying attention to you. Yeah, how would you like to do an ad campaign with us? So I did. It's been a lot of fun. So that was great. Uh, I got to talk to some old friends. Uh, I got to hang out with a reporter for most of the day. Her name was Rebecca. She's very nice. 
Uh, she rode around in the car with me and kind of saw how crazy life was for those first few days. How if I wasn't on the on the air on television uh, doing a, an interview, I was driving to another interview. And while I was driving to that interview, I was doing radio interviews on my phone. And when I wasn't doing interviews, I was getting calls from other people who wanted me to do interviews. It was another 18-hour uh, day of media. And Rebecca was there when I got my first uh, death threat. It's, there have been several since then. But the first one's always the, the most special one you remember. Uh, a guy called. I answered and he was speaking through a voice filter so he sounded like a robot. So I said, hey, what's up? It's my boy Megatron. How you doing, Megatron? And he read me my social security number and said, uh, see you real soon with a bomb. So that was cool. Uh, I called my local Shiloh Police Department. They've been amazing. Uh, they do a lot of extra patrols through my neighborhood the first few weeks to make my family feel safe. Uh, I call and I talk to the desk sergeant. And I say, hi, I'm Ken Bone. Um, I don't know if you've seen me. I've been on television. I've been on the internet. And he said, I don't get on the internet, sir. So I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not why I called. Thursday. Thursday after the debate is when things got really interesting. I did my standard starting the day at about 5.30 or 6 in the morning doing interviews. Uh, I was doing interviews for, let's see, about an hour. And then I had to go to the DMV to get my driver's license renewed. Mm -hmm. You don't get the superstar treatment at the DMV. They don't care if you're on the internet. And they, they could give less of a damn about that. You stand in line like everybody else. So I'll go back home, do a couple more things that I had committed to do. Uh, went and met with Uber when I did the Uber Select thing. A lot of people told me I was a sellout for going and doing this, uh, this event with Uber. Uh, they were launching a new service here in St. Louis. And I went and was the first rider in that service. In exchange, they gave me a, like some free rides with Uber that I've used to get back and forth to the airport to all the traveling I've been doing. And they're all used up already. People seem to think I got like a million dollars for that and that I'm uh, like gonna retire. That's not how it works. You show up to an event for a company, even if it's a big company on a local level, they don't just hurl money at you. So I left from there and went straight to work. While I was at work, I did the Ask Me Anything on Reddit. A lot of people have asked me, why did you use your real Reddit username to do your Ask Me Anything, to do your AMA? Didn't you know that people would look through your whole post history? Uh, no, I didn't. I've been on Reddit for about two years. Um, I didn't realize that there were this many people paying attention. Like, I knew that the AMA request was near the front page. I didn't know that it was going to get, uh, like, 15,000 something comments. And I definitely didn't know that the New York Post was going to be looking through my post history on Reddit, trying to find the, the worst things that I've ever said on the internet to make it look like that represents me as a person and make me look like a jackass. So, no, I didn't see that coming. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. Well, whatever. So I do the Ask Me Anything while I'm at work. Um, don't tell my boss that. Well, he knows, but we don't like to talk about it. Uh, I got a lot of questions from a lot of cool people. I'm still answering questions on my Ken Bone AMA. If you want to ask me a question and it hasn't been answered before, uh, I'll answer it. I don't care, whatever. Uh, would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? And the answer is obvious. You would rather fight the duck-sized horses. You can punt duck-sized horses. Uh, it was a blast. And then by the time the AMA was officially set to end, at about 6 a.m., the first articles were already starting to show up. My friend who's sitting next to me says, hey, look at this article. It says, turns out Ken Bone is an awful person. So I leave from the AMA from work, and I, uh, I get to my house, and Izod is there. I knew a camera crew would be coming. And in my experience, a camera crew is like a dude with a camera, and another dude with a microphone, and uh, maybe one more guy who's telling them what to do. I, I get to my house and there's like 30 people there, production assistants and makeup artists and uh, guys with light towers and multiple cameramen and a director, like a real director and a producer. Uh, the director's name was Adam Reed. Uh, next time you make a commercial, call Adam Reed with Bodega Productions. He was unbelievable. So we get done shooting at my house and we decide we're gonna go down to the bar. We're gonna get just a couple of final shots 
uh, of a, and we're going to get a beer together. So we go down to the bar and it's too loud to shoot, but that's okay because I'm done being on camera for the day. Uh, as we're leaving for the bar, I, I've now been awake for 39 hours and I decided to drive anyway because I'm an idiot. And I back out of my driveway straight into the production assistant's car. So really sorry. Uh, uh, anyway, we go down to the bar, uh, take some more selfies, we go home, go to sleep, uh, wake up in the morning, fly to Washington, D.C. Then we shoot all the stuff that you saw of me laying down on the National Mall and uh, running away from the crowd in slow motion. Uh, that crowd of kids that was chasing me, it was about 20 young people, uh, college age and, and late high school age people, who happened to be walking through a crosswalk in Washington. And when I'm wearing that sweater in a big city like that, especially for that first two weeks or so, people are going to stop me and they're going to want their picture taken. And uh, there was uh, not much I could do about it. And plus, I don't like to tell anybody no because it's fun and I'm kind of a friendly guy. I want to meet people and I want to take my picture with them. So I'm, I walk up to this crosswalk and these kids keep, uh, keep stopping me for pictures. We can't get the shot we want. So the creative director, uh, Mike, comes up with a great idea. Yeah. We're going to do the hard day's night shot of me running away from the crowd. At this point, I have to explain to the young people, this is a bit. This is a bit for a film. Um, please don't try to catch me, because you will catch me. You'll catch me within just a few feet, and then we'll have to do it again. It's 80 degrees out here. I'm wearing a sweater. Weigh 300 pounds. I can only do this shot of running the, I don't know, 50 yard dash or so, so many times before I could catch heat stroke and die. And that number of times turned out to be two. I did it two times and I don't think I could have done it anymore. So we go to the Lincoln Memorial. If you've ever been to the Lincoln Memorial, it's, it's incredible. It's like a spiritual experience. Normally walking up the steps to see President Lincoln would take about three minutes. It took me nearly an hour because when people see Ken Bone, they want to talk to Ken Bone. They want to stop me. Uh, we ran into a wedding party that we'd actually seen earlier in the day at another monument. And we stopped and took pictures with him. And people were physically restraining me to have their picture taken with me. One of the camera guys, the director of photography, Joe, he told me, you know, I shot some film with, uh, with Kanye one time. When people see Kanye in the airport, they go, wow, I think that's Kanye. And then they move on. They do that from like 50 feet away. When people see Ken Bone in the airport, he's the approachable regular guy who doesn't have a team of bodyguards around him. Uh, they walk up to Ken Bone and they touch him. I get up to the top. I get to the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, there's a few hundred people now standing in a semicircle waiting for me to talk to them. Give them a speech. Like, uh, uh, like I'm important. It's weird. It was a surreal feeling. And we had to get a couple shots before I could talk to him. So I'm supposed to be thinking of what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? I've got my big get out the vote message. Uh, I want to reemphasize that. But then I, uh, I go to the feed of the Lincoln Memorial. I take a picture of it with my disposable camera. And uh, I start kind of crying. Because I'm sitting at the feet of uh, one of our nation's greatest heroes. He's, uh, he was our leader in a tumultuous time. He set an entire race of people free, uh, made it possible for their descendants to have the lives they have today. Uh, and people are paying attention to me in that place. And I couldn't believe it. I had to take a couple minutes to compose myself. Uh, yeah, I just think uh, what a great guy like that, what a, a larger than life figure like him could have done with this kind of attention. And was I letting him down? Was I letting leaders like him down? I hope not. I've done the best I can. Uh, so I leave from there. I go back to the airport and, and I fly home. And for the next several days, life continues like that. It's gotten a little slower every day. There's less and less national media attention. Now I do speeches at uh, universities. Uh, and, and my life is slowly returning to normal. My phone doesn't ring off the hook anymore. Uh, I just get occasional fan letters. I don't understand why. 
I don't know why I have fans. Uh, you guys that are watching me, well, some of you might describe yourselves as fans of mine. I don't know why. Uh, I've never produced anything. I've never done anything uh, worthy of having fans over, but I appreciate it. I love your support. Uh, I hope I get to meet you someday. Um, so that's kind of my story up to this point. Very abbreviated. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Uh, I'll be making videos like this a couple times a week until everybody stops watching them, I guess. So thanks. Um, typical YouTuber stuff I've been told I should say here at the end. Like and subscribe. Um, watch all of my videos if you want. Now, so far, this is the only one. Soon there'll be more. Uh, thanks very much for watching. I'm Ken Bone, the Red Sweater Guy. I approve this message.